Hello, everyone. In response to the COVID-19 outbreak, many world leaders have provoked war languages as if the entire world fought both the common war against the virus. When COVID-19 is considered a form of war, whose bodies are subscribed to death? How do they resist death? Critically reading the gendered aspect of COVID-19, I search for answers to this question and further contemplate transnational solidarity for a new just world order in the post-COVID-19 era. The COVID-19 era requires the critical interrogation of social structures because one's social location often becomes a determining factor of whether they have life or death in crisis. As politicians provoke war languages, I argue that we need a critical feminist materialist analysis of who becomes neglected, intentionally ignored, and forced to care for others. Subsequently, this analysis unpacks how the poor's death and debilitation during the pandemic are profoundly gendered and sexual. Imagining transnational feminist solidarity to rebuild the new world order in the post-COVID era, I'm borrowing wisdom from Marcella Arthaus Rice's Indecent Theology. All political theories are sexual theories with theological frames of support. War metaphors for the COVID-19 pandemic are compelling enough to quickly get people's attention to the possible danger. On April 5, 2020, Queen Elizabeth ended her public speech with the phrase, we will meet again. Her speech evoked the famous 1939 World War II ballad, We'll Meet Again by British singer Vera Lynn. Donald Trump called himself the war president. War metaphors for COVID-19 are misleading and even dangerous. The metaphors encourage people to look for embodied enemies, conceal the dead people's real faces by digitizing their death, reinforce patriarchal gender ideology that glorifies an ethic of care, and concentrate medical resources on treating the virus. Poor people's lives, especially women and children, become more precarious during the pandemic just as any war destroys these people's lives first. On a th surface level, the war on COVID-19 portrays the virus itself as the enemy. However, as right-wing politicians worldwide occasionally called it China virus or the Wuhan virus, the enemy becomes to have an East Asian face. In the meantime, the war metaphor justifies the exploitation of civil servants and first respondents. The metaphor produces the dichotomous rhetoric of us and them, which signifies the surge of nationalism across the globe. Although COVID-19 is a global issue that requires a global solution, sovereign nations rely on patriotic nationalism and isolationism. Additionally, the war rhetoric, we are in this together, erases the real faces of the dying. The global poor who are physically and metaphorically dying from COVID-19 are predominantly people of color, indigenous people, prostitutes, migrant laborers, domestic workers, homeless people, undocumented immigrants, refugees, and poor old people. It should be emphasized that the virus is not the only cause of death and debilitation of the global poor, but also the neoliberal global market economy, which has been constructed upon white heteronormative patriarchal family ideologies. When heteropatriarchal family values are reinforced in the crisis, an ethic of care becomes violent. A violent ethic of care happens in two contexts, at the workplace and home. Women predominate workforces at caring facilities, including hospitals and nursing homes, where the group infection often occurs. Hos hospitality industries, such as hotels, restaurants, domestic labor, and child care services, severely hit by COVID-19, are also predominated by female workers. 
At home, the burden of caring falls mostly on women's shoulders. In the pre-COVID-19 period, women's care work was already undervalued because it was not considered a real economy. Almost seven months after the COVID-19 outbreak, the United States overall has regained nearly half of the lost jobs. However, mothers of school-aged children, Black men, Black women, Hispanic men, Asian Americans, younger Americans ages 25 to 34, and people without college degrees have slowly recovered their jobs. Significantly, Black women recovered only 34%. Mothers of children ages 6 to 12 have recovered fewer than 45% of jobs lost, while the employment of fathers of children the same age is 70% back. Furthermore, domestic and family violence, gender violence, and femicide have increased across the globe since the outbreak of COVID-19. Many feminist scholars and activists have called the violence against women and girls a pandemic. It is the oldest pandemic. However, the masculinized war metaphor for COVID-19 prioritizes eliminating virus and minimizing the spread of infection. It alienates all other societal problems, including domestic violence and gender violence. COVID-19 is violent, not only because the virus is deadly, but also because political responses to the virus strengthen heteronormative nationalist space for racialized, gendered, and sexualized violence that kills and debilitates the marginalized at a fast pace. What theoretical discourse would we need in preparation for the post-COVID-19 era or living with COVID-19? How can people of faith radically reimagine a God talk that has liberatory power from death, debilitation, and fear? What we need is not a surge of militarized nationalism, but a radical resurgence of the Jesus solidarity movement with the sensitivities to gender, sexuality, and race. I borrow the term radical resurgence from Nishinabe poet, scholar, and activist Lian Beta Samosake Simpson in Canada. Adding radical to the resurgence movement in the context of First Nations in Canada, Beta Samosake Simpson emphasizes the importance of confirming body sovereignty and taking back resurgence from neoliberalism. Radical resurgence engages visioning, thinking, acting, and mobilizing around indigenous systemic alternatives that respect ancestors, two-spirit queer people, non-binary gender hierarchy, nature, and non-human nations. Beta Samosaki Simpson's radical resurgence reminds me of Marcella Arthaus Rye's indecent theology because of her revolutionary method to rediscover God in indecent theology. Indecent theology might be the radical resurgence of liberation theology in preparation for the post-COVID-19 era. Indecent theology engages sexual metaphors to trace obscenities of God and interrogate the poor's embodied experiences in the neoliberal capitalist world. In these sexual metaphors, Althaus Rice argues for the homosolidarity of God with the poor who are created in image of God. What we need in order to explore our uncertainties created by COVID-19 is sexual metaphors rather than war metaphors. Through sexual metaphors, we can understand that the war metaphor is the masculinist agenda equipped with the necro power over the poor and even nature. We will never win the war against COVID-19. Instead, sexual metaphors allow us to reimagine the community of faith and God's radical justice that requires to overcome the hierarchical binary system. COVID-19 shows the current global political and economic system's failure, namely the decency that disguises the aggressive masculinist 
heteropatriarchal global political economy does not work. As Arthur's right eloquently speaks, to create an alternative system, we should learn to do theology grounded in indecency, sexuality of the poor, and sexual politics of queer people's experiences. They challenge the system vehemently. They are resurrected again and again after sovereignty's brutal execution of their bodies. An alternative system in the post COVID-19 era relies on indecent people's survivor wisdom whose sexuality has been demoralized, exploited and mutilated. This wisdom is well archived by indigenous women and children, black womanists and feminist non-binary gender and queer folks, immigrants of color and poor women. The traces left by these people will pave a way to the radical resurgence of the alternative system of life that has been erased by decent systematic theology and the system in general. Thank you.